the, um, I actually gave this talk in the middle of the year, so I'll, I'll cut it down a bit for the day, but this talk to a computer and philosophy uh, conference in uh, Mexico City like earlier in the year. And the talk actually comes out of uh, a book that I thought I might write when I retired. I retired in 2013. And like a lot of old people, they think, well, you know, I've got all this stuff behind me. I'll try and make something coherent about it. And then I started thinking about who I should aim the book at, uh, what sort of audience, who would read it. The more I thought about that, um, the less settled, the more sure I was that probably nobody would. And then I thought, why? Why probably won't it? Why is it almost certainly true that hardly anybody will read it? Is it just me, or is it? Is there a bigger issue? And then I started thinking about. Well, I've been working in computer ethics, um, nanotechnology ethics, ethics of uh, technology more generally for quite a long time, but it seemed to have almost zero effect on the world. Right? There are all these people working on the ethics of technology, ethics of science, and what happens? Everything keeps on going exactly the same. So that sort of made me a bit more reluctant to write a book. Um, and around the time I was thinking about this, an article came out in Australia too by somebody who had been working on environmental ethics for about 30 years. And she was raising the same point about that. She said, we've been talking about environmental ethics, pushing environmental ethics now for a long time. And what are we doing? We're making things worse for the environment rather than better. We don't, it doesn't seem to be having much effect. Anyway, I know, I know it sound um, too negative. It could be just the right things of, of an old man. But I started to think then too about uh, the technology side. Why isn't it having any effect? And I came to the conclusion that, and I'm talking from the perspective of the West, Primary. Now we have a computer, now we have a technology fetish. Right? And I'll, I'll say what I mean by a fetish in a minute. Now the background for this uh, talk, um, or some background, the relationship between technology and humans. Now we don't run, swim, fly, climb trees, dig burrows, etc. Etc. very well. Our senses are only middle range. We don't see as well as eagles or we can't scent things as well as dogs and, and so on. So really we are fairly helpless creatures in lots of ways compared with other things not in not parts of the or parts of the non-human world. And we need technology to survive. And when we look at indigenous cultures, they'll all have some sort of technology. They'll have digging sticks, they'll have spears, they might have bows and arrows, all sorts of things that help them get their food, help them defend themselves, and so on. So we have to have technology. We're technology or technological creatures, whether we like it or not. So on the one hand, I'm saying that we have got a technology fetish. On the other hand, I'm saying that well, we're technological creatures. We have to have technology. And I believe in both of those things. Now, OK, so that's a given us. We are technology, technological creatures. We have to have technology. Ortega y Gasset, the Spanish philosopher, I think he might have written in the, well, the early part of the last century anyway. Um, he talked about technology, sort of why we have it, and it's the improvement brought about on nature by man for the necessity, for the satisfaction of his necessities, like having, um, having a spear helps us um, get our food, and, and, and one that 
and he's saying the pur one purpose or the main purpose of technology perhaps is not being, but well-being is a fundamental necessity of man, of human. I just I don't want to just exist, I want to I want to live well. And this issue about what living well is, human well-being has come up before. Therefore the main aim of technology he went on to say is to promote good life, well-being by adapting the medium to the will of the individual. So what humans try to do using technology is adapting the world to our wants, to our needs, so that we can live more comfortably. Right, so I'm taking those two things as given. One is we're technological creatures. Another is that the aim of technology is to help us live better lives whatever we mean by that. Now, a bit more background, there's a lot of scepticism of science and of experts these days, certainly in Australia, and I suspect in a lot of other countries. And one, well, before I get on to, before I, before I say more about that, this is a quote from Kernan. Um, we should be connect, concerned about the growing neglect of science and about the overt attacks on it from different sides. <coughs> and two good examples these days are anti-vaxxers and, and people who are against vaccinating their children, even though all the evidence seems to be that um, it's beneficial and not harmful, except perhaps in very, very, very rare cases. And climate change sceptics. Uh, We're having um, one of the worst droughts in Australia on record, and we are having bad fires months before our fire season normally starts. And even rainforests are burning that are normally wet all the time. And yet a lot of people are still saying, well, it's got nothing to do with climate change. It's just one of those things that happens in cycles. Ignoring the fact that this cycle has never come around before, at least not in, uh, not in any recorded time. So there's a lot of scepticism about science, certainly in some quarters. But there seems to be a lot less scepticism about technology. Right? There seems to be an overwhelming love of technology. This is getting back to or getting off to the fetish. There are different meanings of fetish, as you probably know. But the way I'm using it, and this is one accepted meaning, um, the fetish is an accepted, sorry, an excessive and irrational devotion or commitment to a particular thing. It's something we want, even though um, there might be good reason not to. We've got this excessive and irrational devotion or commitment to it. So do we have an excessive and irrational <coughs> devotion or commitment to technology? And by the end of my talk, you'll be absolutely convinced that we do. <laughs> now, the Western world view, this is, I'm painting very broad brush strokes here, is that paradigm is that technological progress is good. All right, technological progress is good. A new technology is good, even if it doesn't really, even if it isn't really, um, real progress, even if it doesn't progress things very much. If it's new, we seem to think that it's good, and I'll have some examples in a little while. But is there really a technology fetish? We have techno-optimists. Um, this person says, life is getting better, poverty continues, nose diving, adult literacy is at an all-time high. People around the world are living longer, living in democracies, and better educated than any other time in history. Meanwhile, the digital revolution has resulted in a glut of informational abundance, helping to correct the informational asymmetries that have long plagued 
mankind. That is the new thing to get over optimistic. But um, it's a fairly typical view. Then we have techno pessimists. Um, and this one, this person is saying, without the responsible and steady guiding hand, it becomes useless and perhaps detrimental. That's technology. Humanity must recognise the limits of technology and look to more realistic solutions to modern problems. Right, so we have techno optimism, and you can find lots of this if you search the web. Techno pessimism, you'll find some as well. So, am I overstating the case by saying that there's a fetish when there is a lot of uh, pessimism, well, some pessimism around as well? Now, just a couple of things here um, about AI first. There is, while many people are fearful about the increased use of AI, machines and robots in the workplace, the move to a more autom automated future is inevitable. This is a quote from, I can't read, I might have it here, but that's a direct quote, right? So if you look at what people are saying about AI, if you read the papers uh, or look at things online, um, there's an enormous optimism. People are saying that this is going to be great. Self-driving cars are going to be wonderful, um, automated, um, well, everything else is going to be wonderful. But not only is it going to be wonderful, it's inevitable. There's nothing we can do about it, so we might as well learn to love it. Now, this consulting firm has recently re uh, released its 2019, uh, yeah, 2019 report uh, based on interviews with 1,000 US companies, 20% of executives of companies with AI initiatives are planning to roll out, roll out AI across all the business, businesses this year. This was you know, 2019. Again, the assumption is that all of this is good. We're going to do it. It doesn't matter if there are problems or only minor things. It's overall um, introducing AI is a good thing. Well, development continues apace. This is why um, it worried me a bit when I was trying, when I was thinking about the purpose of writing a book on the ethics of technology, because if I raise issues that I think are concerning, is anybody going to take any notice? And I had this horrible feeling that people mightn't take any notice. And there are lots of cases, I'll look at some of them later, um, expressed worries seem not to be taken seriously. Uh, perhaps they are taken seriously, that's one way of looking at it, but on examination they aren't very serious at all. Right? People raise issues about AI, examine them and think, and then others examine them and say, well, it's not really a problem. So that's a possibility. But another possibility, and it seems to me the more plausible uh, answer, is that we just love new technologies. We're going to accept them at all costs. We have this technology fetish. The fetish is to continue technological developments and solution, regardless of any expressed concerns, regardless of what anybody, any what are problems that people raise. Technological fixes are preferred over lifestyle changes. Um, I mean, this this has come up, um, well, it comes up time and time again, but in one of the um, cases, one of the recent cases, has been discussions about geoengineering to help solve the um, climate change problem. Some say, yeah, we should. Or there are various possibilities of um, blocking out some of the sun's light, sucking um, uh, the um, carbon out of the air, and so on. And those uh, 
fix that's often seem to be more um, for people like those who are actually changing their lifestyle. And we have all of these things, of course, in health issues as well. So instead of um, changing our lifestyle, we or our diet or whatever, we will get various um, medical ways of fixing our problems. So technological fixes are preferred over lifestyle changes. I don't think all technological fixes are wrong. I don't think they're all bad. And it may even be that in climate change, that with climate change we've left it too late for lifestyle changes to fix it. We may have to have more dramatic um, technological fixes. I don't know. Um, that would be a shame, but it's a possibility, I guess. But anyway, we do seem to accept the uh, technological fixes. It seems to me too that we're actually on a technological treadmill. We bring in new technologies, they create problems in certain ways, but we like them overall. So what do we do? We find more technology then to try and fix those problems caused by that technology. And then this new technology designed to fix the previous one creates more so it's just on and on and on, more and more technology, so we're on like a little mouse running around on a treadmill in a cage. Okay, the technological fetish in a bit more of trying to separate out some of the issues. I just want to separate out some of the, the levels of thinking about technology. Now there is a lot of work going on in the philosophical side, not only philosophy, but in uh, a lot of social sciences and whatnot about what's technology for. Um, and there's a big awareness in this literature of the problems at the, at the philosophical level. Then at the level of new technologies, all, we, all people are interested in basically is innovation and new products. And then the third level is the level of the use of these technologies. And clearly when we get down to use, we do have regulation. Um, I mean, the simple cases like cars, everybody, every country will tell you which side of the road you have to drive on, and most people obey it like that. Um, so we have lots of regulations with use, we have very few regulations with what sort of new products, and there's a lot of issues that are raised at the philosophical level. And my argument is that the fetish issue is primarily at this level, this development of, of new technologies and uh, bringing in of new products and the acceptance of them. Okay, I'm talking about computers for a bit. So there's, in my view, an excessive and irrational devotion or commitment to computer technology. We're wedded to the idea that computers have to constantly get faster and have more memory. We're developing quantum computers which are going to be orders of magnitude faster on. It's not clear that they'll be able to do all the things that other computers can do. Moore's law, which says that um, it says that computers have their doubling memory and capacity every two years or something like that. And some people think it's terrible that um, Moore's law may end if we don't develop new materials. This is one area where nanotech has become important. But why does it matter? Nobody really tells us why it matters. We just um, seem to think that it does. Networks are getting bigger, faster, and so we have to develop um, things have to become more and more networked, and I'll say a bit more about that. Surveillance technology is often seen as a good thing because it can increase safety and so on. Uh, 
it's not often. The issue isn't often raised that the more we're under surveillance, um, the less we trust. So as surveillance goes up, the level of trust in general goes down. And if we don't have a lot of trust in the community, then that seems to be a bad thing for humans too. But anyway, we'll talk about that later. Um, artificial intelligence, which I've already mentioned, um, is seen as a good thing regardless. One of the things that comes up continually is that self-driving cars are going to be a lot safer. So many people get killed and injured on roads driving uh, the cars, and most of the, or a lot of them, are caused by human error. We could easily solve that without self-driving cars, of course. We don't have to have cars that go 150 k an hour. We could have cars that go 50 k an hour. We're still all going to get from A to B. It will just take us a bit longer. So, but that's not the way we look at things. Developments in computing are seen as good in themselves. So we're going to keep developing all these new technologies regardless. So it seems without question. Now just a few issues on the fifth generation mobile network which will be will presumably coming fairly soon. One of my friends at home is quite excited about this. It's going to be much faster, enable much more networking, for example the Internet of Things, everything, almost everything will be able to be connected. We've got our smart houses, which will you know, be able to regulate the temperature for us, tell us what's in our fridge, unlock the doors, probably tell us if we're too tired to do things and so on. Smart clothing, which will be able to um, sense what's going on in our body. And, and when people, a lot of people have Fitbits now, well, I mean, it's sort of, you could have a big, Fitbit all over you, but already Fitbits, the information can go to Google and then go anywhere. So if we have this constant, um, we can have this constant information about our body, about our state of health and so on, it will all be networked. Supposedly, that's a good thing, etc. Those are all supposedly advantages of fifth generation network. It's going to enable much more data collection and surveillance. So it's not clear to me that the benefits or the progress, which all seem to me to be pretty small, um, outweigh the dangers of uh, this extra data collection and surveillance. And just as an example, I'm not picking on China for um, any other reason except that as far as I know, they're the only country in the world that's actually proud of this. Putting it all up line, online so you can see what they're doing. They're telling us all the time, fairly <laughs> regularly, about what's happening. Okay, China's... This, this came out this year too. China has made a music video promoting the importance of integrity and trustworthiness ahead of the scheduled national rollout of the controversial social credit system next year. Now, this is a system where you get points or something if you behave in certain ways and points taken off if you don't. So your travel, for example, might be... Um, made more difficult if you don't do what um, the authorities think you should be doing, you'll be rewarded if you do what they want. The social credit system uh, is to rate trustworthiness of uh, Chinese citizens and the stated aim, uh, that's a, a desirable way to measure and enhance trust nationwide and to build a culture of sincerity. It will forge a public 
continued environment where keeping trust is glorious. It will strengthen sincerity in government affairs, commercial sincerity, social sincerity, and the construction of judicial credibility. This is what it's aiming for. Right? And this is all, in, I mean, you can see all of this, all of this information is in the public domain. They're not hiding it, they, are, they see it as, as a big advance. Now, to me, it doesn't seem to be quite that good. I mean, imagine if we have a fairly nasty dictator again in the future, which we probably will have at some stage, say like Hitler or Stalin or even worse. They've got all this information about everybody. And online, I mean, they've got all this information online. And so very easily they'll be able to see what everybody's doing, uh, or at least focus on people that they're a bit worried about. So they're going to have enormous power, much more than they did before the advent of the internet. Yeah, I know this is actually going back there in 2014. They released the roadmap for a comprehensive social credit system, which would assign citizens, firms, and organisations a credit score based on multiple economic and social categories. The data driven system would help make market objectives by effectively extending financing options to the country's large uh, unbanked population, ideological objectives by addressing corruption and, and so on. Now we can see why this has got some appeal. We all want to live in a secure place. We all want to live in a um, prosperous country. But if this is the way to do it, we're going to be, or we are, we will be paying a very big price. Like we're not, people won't be behaving well because they're nice people. They will be behaving well because they'll be scared that if they don't, they're going to be punished in some way by the government or by some authority. But it's not only China, I mean, the West and presumably other countries um, in other parts of the world too, continue to develop all of this technology, seemingly oblivious to any of these sorts of, of worries. The worries are just all brushed off as if it doesn't get any matter much. AI, that's all I'll say about the surveillance thing because I'm, I just want to raise these two issues as examples of um, areas where we go ahead developing technology despite any worries, where it seems to me the benefits aren't really all that great, um, but we still want to do it. One is the surveillance area, the network, and the other one is AI. Now, the AI thing is interesting, the, well, we chose the other one, but the other one doesn't really date back very far. We haven't had the internet for all that long. Um, and it certainly hasn't been um, all pervasive uh, for very long. I remember when I started teaching in computer science first, there was a debate at the university whether it was worthwhile getting email. You know, should the university be connected to the national email system? Not everybody thought so. I mean, now that's just laughable because everybody's connected to everything. But AI has been around for a long time. And one of the first things I wrote, I think, when I was getting into computer ethics first, was a paper called what computers shouldn't do, and one of the main people I looked at was um, Joseph Weizenbaum. 
who raised, and I'll say, I'll have to get more of that in a minute, but he raised a lot of these issues about AI and computers in general in 1976, which was before some of you were born, so it's, it's not new. Okay, Weizenbaum. He's, he's one of my favourite. Uh, he was a, one of the um, pioneers in computing and in AI. That's why I think it's worthwhile taking notice of what he said. He died a few years ago in Germany. He says, the very asking of the question, what does a judge or a psychiatrist know that we cannot tell a computer is a monstrous obscenity. He doesn't mix his words. If he doesn't like something, you know quite well that he doesn't like it. That it has to be put into print at all, even for the purposes of exposing its morbidity, is a sign of the madness of our times. Computers can make judicial decisions. Computers can make psychiatric judgments. They can flip coins in much more sophisticated ways than can the most patient human being. The point is that they ought not to be given such tasks. So anything, his argument is that anything that can be that involves human judgment should never be, um, that task should never be assigned to a computer. And he said this in 1976. Um, some of you may have come across a little computer program called ELISA, which is sort of a natural language processing one, but very simple. And it sort of gives you um, um, psychiatric or psychological advice. And he liked that. And uh, well, sort of for fun, but sort of to show what a computer could do. But then he started to realise that a lot of his students were taking it seriously and, and, and trying to use it when nobody else was looking and were really believing what it said. And that's why, or one reason why he thought that um, it was something you shouldn't do because he knew what was inside that program and there actually was hardly anything inside it. And it's one of the things that when I was teaching computing, I set as an assignment for students because it's quite easy to write a program that looks clever. You know, you type in something, you get an answer. But whereas in what's inside is hardly anything. He says, all, program, all projects that propose to substitute a computer system for a human function that involves personal respect, understanding, and love are obscene. The very contemplation ought to give rising feelings of disgust in every civilised person. So I guess what follows from that is that if you don't have feelings of disgust, you're not a civilised person. He, um, as I said, doesn't um, sort of try and tone down his language. And this, well, this comes from a little book called. Um, uh, Computers and human reason, or something, I just can't remember the quote, but you'll easily find it. It's still in print, I think. Okay, now the point in, in showing you Weizenbaum and some of the others is that on the one hand, we've had people who know about the technology raising issues, and in this case, since 1976, but nobody seems to, or at least the developers, don't seem to take any notice. The development of AI is still going on pace, probably faster than ever before. When I started working on this sort of stuff, there wasn't really much in the way of AI because the technology wasn't up to it yet, to any great extent. That's changed a lot in the last few years. Now, what's the problem that, that Weizenbaum is raising? Suggests that humans are like machines. Suggests that machines are better than humans, certainly in some things. Reduces human contact. These are all things that he um, was worried about. Reduces scope for care. Reduces ability to develop virtues. And some argue, I think that um, it was 
dehumanising. Now, I can't go into any of these in detail. There's a lot that can be said about all of those. Um, but I'll just leave Weizenbaum there as an example of somebody who was raising issues a long time ago. And if, uh, if you so feel like it, you can um, have a look at um, and like you said, as I said, you'll easily find him online. Well, now you might need to be careful where you, which entry on Google you click. I remember clicking on one, and I must have accidentally clicked on a German site and a trend, and a, where it translated it into English. And instead of calling him Joseph Weizenbaum, it called him Joseph Wigtree. That's the literal translation of his name, the German came in English. Jim Paul, who some of you may have come across, he did a lot of work uh, up until recently, he's retired now too. Um, he takes uh, a slightly, well, a different line from Weizenbaum, and he said computers can improve life and model things to use it for that. But he did think that we should be looking at what values are put into or which values um, the computer would use to make decisions. And that's the way, as he says, a human responsibility. Um, relinquishing this oversight to responsibility, this is public, says is an in indefensible abduction abdication rather of um, our responsibility if a computer is going to make decisions then it, um, humans should be able to override it. This issue is coming up in a practical way now in the case of um, self-driving cars and there's been a bit of discussion at home I guess there has been everywhere where they're talking about self-driving cars. But if a car is driving along and, say, a child steps out onto the road, um, who will, uh, which people will the car try and save, the child or the occupants? Now, I mean, that's a problem if you're a human as well. What do you do? You swerve to miss the child, roll over, roll over and kill everybody in the car? Or you just run into the child? Um, both options are awful. The problem though is, I mean, people would make that decision in a split second and then have to live with it. We'd be responsible for whatever decision we made. If that um, decision making is built into the car, is there anybody who's responsible? I guess the people who built that system, put that into the car, would have to be the ones who responsible but it's it's an interesting issue a lot of these issues like that that come up in in ethics are completely hypothetical but this one isn't hypothetical so it might be well there are um, self-driving cars around already of course so it's it's a practical problem i think in germany they've actually got a, um, a policy that's come out on that James Lenman takes a slightly different line again on AI and he says that, well he focuses on what gives us meaning in life, what satisfies our needs. Now we might be able to do a lot of things using computers, but that might take a lot of the meaning out of life. Um, because it takes away something that we enjoy doing. Uh, one of the simple examples for me is using a GPS system to find out how to get somewhere. Right? It makes life a lot easier, but you get absolutely no satisfaction. If I didn't know where I was going, I had to read a map, I got to where I wanted to go without any problems, I get this great feeling of satisfaction because I knew I could read a map. Any fool can follow, you, follow the instructions on GPS, so we don't have to think, right? We, we are much better than North Martin. We just, here's that turn, left turn right in 100 metres or whatever, and we do it. Um, 
Okay, it's, it's a trivial example, but I think it, it does take away something that at least gives people like me satisfaction. So often I don't use the, the thing anyway. Okay, so those are some of the historical warnings about um, artificial intelligence. There have been some recent ones as well. There was recently a UN panel about the dangers of AI super intelligence. Uh, artificial intelligence, well, there are there's a lot more that can be said about artificial intelligence at that level too. Um, and what, what we're talking about where the technology is today, well, it's basically it's having machines that can do more or less things within the range that humans can do. Perhaps a bit better in some cases, but more or less within the range of humans. But now people are talking about super intelligence where the machines will have intelligence way beyond anything that um, we've got. Uh, Nick Bostrom, who's at Oxford, um, said this, I think he said this in about 2014, super intelligence represents an existential risk to humanity, which he defined as a risk that threatens the premature existence of Earth originating intelligent life or the permanent and drastic destruction of its potential for desirable future development. Now that's, that may be overstating the case, but he certainly wasn't alone in raising the issue of the super intelligent machines that could be around by the next 20 or 30 years perhaps. Stephen Hawking, who most of you would have heard of, he died recently. Um, Elon Musk, I'm sure you've all heard of. They were two um, of the people who signed an open letter in the last, probably about 2014 or 15, warning of a robot uprising. Now, a lot of these claims are ridiculed, right? but I think it's interesting that or it's interesting why they are ridiculed. They tend to be ridiculed by people who love the technology and don't see any problems. Um, now, some problems are problems now. They are problems for the, for the distant future. And the super intelligence probably is. It's not a, an immediate problem like self-driving cars or um, the sort of surveillance technology that's being developed now. Some of these distant future problems, some people say, don't worry about problems in the distant future because we'll have technology to solve them by then. Um, some of us who have got children and grandchildren tend to be a bit more worried because while these things won't affect us, then they may well affect their grandchildren. And that's not talking hypothetically, because if we've got grandchildren, these people are here now. Uh, they're not people in the distant future who don't exist yet. And so we do tend to worry about that. Um, Luciano Ferrigi, yeah, he's also in Oxford. He thinks these things are logically possible, these super intelligence, but intelligences, but they won't ever happen. Um, Margaret Bowden, another well-known AI person, doesn't think it'll happen for a long time. Uh, I'll just get a little to finish. Uh, this is that old that slide before, so we've got these three levels of thinking about new technologies. And the fetish, as I said, applies mainly to the second one. We have these overriding values, at least in Western society, of uh, productivity and efficiency. The culture of consumption is one mostly created by the concepts, concept of plan obsolescence, whereby the products are initially designed to last for only a short period, then we go and buy a new one. Regarding the electronics industry, there has been from the start the idea that the cycle would be about two years and then we have this 
enormous amount of waste. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. The in Europe or the continental Europe, they have this program called Responsible Research and Innovation, uh, which is a process by which the people developing in the, uh, the societal actors and in innovators try and look at the um, social desirability of the new technologies. They would um, the, the uh, precautionary principle would, would play a role there. The English speaking world that includes the UK, or the UK at least previous Brexit months, um, was probably getting more into some of the ideas in Europe. In the US and in Australia, um, I think we lag in some of these things. Can we do anything? Some people will argue that, okay, technological development's inevitable. Even if we wanted to, we can't do anything. But science and technology are really guided to some extent. A lot of funding these days comes from private industry. So that funding goes to projects which are going to make money for that industry. Uh, medical research is a good example of that. Um, we do have, so things can be guided to some extent by funding, by government funding, by industry funding, but it is already. And we do put controls on the development of some technologies, for example, chemical weapons, even if it um, doesn't work all that well. Should we do anything? Uh, well, and I think it's not just a matter of looking at individual technologies. I think if we want to do anything, it has to be a matter of looking at overall values in the, in the society that we're in. Um, one of the indigenous writers in Australia said the incredible advances in science and engineering need to be analysed against the direction they take us before we employ every new toy. Seems to me that there are a number of things that we need to think about. These might look much like issues in technological or in technology, but being dead is being dead so bad. We have this thing that comes up all the time these days about this is good and this is good and this is good because it's going to help us live a bit longer. But as somebody said recently, none of us get out of this life alive. So why, did, why are we so worried about this? Okay, we need to be healthy. I'd much rather be healthy than not healthy. Whether I'd much rather be alive than dead, I've got no idea because I'm never been dead. Um, how do we get enjoyment? Do we actually get enjoyment? Or what sort of enjoyment do we get from all this new technology? Population control, I think, is um, something that needs to be looked at. Individualism versus communalism, because our technology um, often is geared towards um, making us consume more as individuals. It's not really looking at the good of the community in lots of cases. And our relation with uh, non-human nature is particularly important. And the conclusion, do we have a technology fetish? Yes. Technology in the social environment. Do we want to live in a surveillance society? Most of us would say no, I think. Do we want to transfer our economy to machines? Most of us, again, would probably say no. But the way we are going ahead with technology, both of these things will almost certainly happen. Unless climate change wipes us all out first. Technology in a natural environment, are we losing the benefits of being in nature? We had a talk yesterday about the benefits of being in nature. The more we use technology by and large, the less we experience nature. Technology and how we evolve, are we getting too far from the way that we evolve? I mean, we have re evolved in non-human nature, we are part of it. Now, um, we're getting to the stage where 
we don't even talk to people so much anymore. We do it all um, online. So that's my argument that we have a computer, that we have a technology finish and we should try and do something about it. Thanks. Thank you very much, John. Um, I think uh, we have a time for a couple of questions. Who would like to ask a question? Okay, Ryan, please. Uh, good morning, Professor. My concern is about the relationship between values and technology. Um, does technology create new values or new values determine the kind of technology? that we have. Uh, I have observed, for instance, in the Philippines, at least in my case, in our community, people did not have television sets. And so those who have television set, they kind of represent a certain status symbol in society. Right now, the TV is no longer a status symbol. It's almost meaningless because everybody has gadgets and cell phones. Still, the car is a status symbol for some, but for professionals, Right? Like us, it's no longer a status symbol. It becomes some sort of a necessity. So I understand the usefulness of uh, technology when it comes to the necessities of human life, but at the same time, when you observe children and you want to develop values in them, you feel that it might be bad that they use cell phone or they are on social media, or at least you have to regulate their use of social media so that you can at least in terms of the kind of values and culture that we have, uh, Catholic, uh, communitarian, we at least still possess that uh, authority over these kids. I do not know if it's right or wrong to be able to do so because children, of course, want their freedom, but their understanding of freedom has also evolved and expanded with the influence of social media. So this is my concern. Um, does, does technology create values or do values determine the kind of technology that people should be able to involve themselves with. Yeah, thanks. Look, I think that in principle the values should be overriding um, and should determine what technologies we develop and how we uh, use those technologies. Uh, I think that technology can I don't think it creates new values, but I think it creates situations in which values rise in a different way. Um, I mean, we didn't have to worry about the status symbol of cars or television sets or anything once because I mean, nobody had them. And when everybody's got them, we don't have to worry. I presume that Indigenous people in Australia, anyway, from what I've read, they didn't, they didn't have a status it wasn't a status symbol to have a spear because everybody would make their own, right? So there was much more um, equality. The technology clearly um, creates problems, at least in the early stages of the new technology, with respect to equity. Yeah, and that can raise other issues than, I guess, with, um, yeah, just the way people are treated. Uh, who can get good jobs and so on, who can get good education because the technology is not at least initially evenly distributed. That's not a new problem, it just arises in a different way because of the technology. Okay. Yeah, um, thank you very much, John. This is a very interesting lecture.